<laughs> All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, this time uh, for I think this is the last keynote before uh, before we do a panel um, and sort of close out the day. But I'm really happy to have uh, Jeff Stead uh, joining us. He's the CPO of Babel, um, and so I will hand it over and then come back at the end for some Q and A. So I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Everyone, great to be here. Um, yeah, as Scott said, I'm I'm Jeff Stead. Uh, work at Babel, language learning company, um, and I've I've been totally enjoying listening to some of these other speakers and these inspiring people and interesting companies doing cool stuff. And um, I guess I'm going to try and approach this from a tech side. So I've heard fantastic ideas from learner sides, from kind of learner advocates, from from teachers, from different aspects of learning. And I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit as if I'm a robot, right? What, what are, where, what's technology's role in this learning space? It's partly a, a Jeff perspective and partly a Babel perspective. So I, I hope it's helpful. So I guess sometimes um, I, I've, I've spent my career in ed tech, not only language learning, but all sorts of other learning technology, apps, websites, DVDs, just how, how you fit these virtual reality, just how you fit these things together. And quite often, um, the whole learning with technology space seems to be pitched like a, a battle. You know, is is the technology as good as a teacher? What, what, what's the what's the, the tension between a teacher and a robot? What 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 is that? What is that kind of battle look like? And I guess I don't see it like that at all. I see it as a sort of interesting set of tools that don't exactly match, and trying to understand the best blend of those tools. And so, really, I just wanted to talk you through some of what's working for us and what we find interesting. So probably have to start from this place in time, right here, right now. You know, millions of people across the globe suddenly spending their, their life on their sofa, clocked into Zoom, try, being forced into digital learning, even though they didn't think they'd want to be in digital learning. Um, big data, hacking, refugees, mass moving of population. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of fairly crazy time at the moment, full of people who displaced out of their usual patterns or, 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 or don't, can't afford the, the skills they need to progress in their lives. So it's, a, it's quite a disrupted moment, disruptive moment in time, um, which is also a kind of interesting moment in time, because often when there's a disruption, that's where you, you stop and really reflect on what works and what doesn't work. And I'm an I'm a advocate of digital for lots of reasons. And I guess the one the one reason is the, the sort of open accessness of it, right? So, so um, I can create a learning podcast here at my sofa in, I'm in Cambridge in England at the moment, and my my cousin in South Africa can listen to it and learn from that. And you know, a stranger in stranger in India can listen to it and learn from that. And suddenly, you've got this sort of mass audience and ability to make something available to to millions and millions of people which is a sort of a hugely empowering thing. And that's one of these sort of superpowers that digital, that, that digital brings us, that the web and that all of these open standards bring to us. Another thing is just scale and reach, right? So, so, so all it takes is, a, a, you, you've heard some amazing companies today talking about the stuff they're doing. And in some cases, it's really just a small group of inspired people, five, 10 people who've got together, they've got this cool idea about a way to learn or a way to practice speaking or a way to partner up with other, with other learners. And they've, they've worked away and built one simple, small piece of tech. And that tech suddenly can, make, can roll out across the globe, right? It can, it can service millions of, use, of learners across the globe. You can come in and try it out. Just this really, really small team of people. So again, that's, that's a, a level of scaling that you just don't get with human to human uh, teaching. But, but it allows you to just get a mass reach. It's just a, 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 if you get the idea right and you, um, you sort of perfect it, you get scale. So that's another awesome, awesome sort of digital digital superpower that you don't have with the face-to-face -face teaching. I, I I love just thinking about the scale here, and so so especially with COVID at the moment, you hear a lot of big numbers, and and sometimes it's hard to get your head around what big numbers really mean. But so just think of twenty million people, get a perspective what that's like, right? That's a a third of the UK population or something. It's a, it's a large number of people. And you think about digital learning platforms. So if you if you go back a couple of years, um, that was the time when MOOCs were exploding. These sort of online learning platforms, free access, specializing in in many 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 people coming in and out. 
And um, throughout 2018, which was probably one of the peaks of the MOOC, of the MOOC era, um, 20 million students across the globe logged into a MOOC to do learning. So free learning, different subjects, different MOOCs, different platforms. That's an amazing number of people, right? You think 20 people in a classic classroom, this is 20 million. Right, that same 20 million, just this is pre-COVID, when, pe when people were still caught up in other things in their lives. There's a platform called Twitch, where you log in and you watch other people playing, which is a way of learning to play, learning to play video games. You, you're watching people playing, so you, you're voluntarily going in and opting in to learn by watching. They had the same number of people, 20 million users logging in every two weeks. So that's a year, two weeks. Um, and not, and, and not even just logins, the average time that those learners were spending watching other people playing was 95 minutes a day. So if you're thinking about learning, 95 minutes a day being put in voluntarily by people who are keen to learn skills that they don't have, and 2 million of them coming in every two weeks, this is phenomenal. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy scale. If you log back into Twitch right now, you'll see they're getting that in one week. So they've doubled. The, the, the number of people doing work on Twitch uh, has doubled. And double this, I mean, we, we're also experiencing the same at Babbel. We've doubled. So we have double the number of users coming in because of the COVID time. We've, people are staying with, or, or, you, or their learning sessions are expanding significantly. I'm not quite sure whether it's doubled, but the, the amount of time they're spending per, per week, per day is, is significantly increased. Um, this is a particularly sort of crazy time right now with, with people having more free time and actively trying to, to, to fill their brains with good in, in that time. But, but really, again, this is just a significant number. And it's really helpful to hang on to numbers like this when you, when you get, if you ever get caught up in discussions, which I, I often get sort of challenged on about what is the role of tech? You know, surely teachers are better. And just this, this raw sheer scale of people um, yeah, so I mentioned we're Babbel. Um, you've probably heard of us. We're a language learning app, Berlin-based. Uh, we have a New York office as well. Um, and we've quite a lot of people. So there's 650 people, I think, is probably our latest count. It's hard to keep tabs of it, especially at the moment when we're all sitting on our sofas. Um, 50 nationalities, very, very diverse bunch of people based in, um, on the, the, based in Mitte in Berlin. So if you're ever in town, please come and visit us. Um, and we just focus on language learning. So we have we have an app and some web access, and primarily it's it, it's just it's language learning. It starts from A zero A one up to, to to probably C one. Although actually most of our learners are, are in the A's and the very bottom of the B's. Um, we, we 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 sell fourteen languages. Although the vast majority of our languages are probably the top five, six most obvious ones that you would you would guess, English, German, French, Spanish, Italian. Um, um, and, but really, I, I just wanted to, I didn't particularly want to be talking about Babel today. I really just wanted to be reflecting on tech and learning and how those things fit together. And there's four areas I wanted to cover. I, um, you can see them on the slide. I won't read them out to you again. But, but it's when you think about where really innovative use of tech is happening in learning, where are the places you look? You're in a good place right here, right now, because you're looking in language learning and often language learning outside a traditional classroom. But but this is advice I give to anybody looking at the combining of, of, of learning and technology. And um, especially if you go into the mainstream, if you go into schools, if you go to universities, if you go into sort of ministries of education and you, you try and get involved in, in why they're not innovating more with tech or how to innovate more with tech, there's a sort of a... Um, I guess the term's Mexican standoff. It's one of these, these moments where everybody's blocking everybody else. So th there's a sort of standoff between um, a, a, the mainstream education really wanting to innovate, innovate and in needing to try out some new crazy concepts or bring in new tech. Um, there's a sort of this, the structure of the curriculum that you need to show progress against and assessment and w the publishers selling the resources that go into the mainstream education and all of these all of these stakeholders would like to innovate more and would like to int introduce new technology and would like to try and build new tools, but they're sort of held up by the other ones. It's in a kind of awkward, it's in an awkward triangle of everybody holding everybody else up. And for that, the kind of language learning you've been hearing a lot about throughout the day and the kind that Babel does, we're in a lucky sweet spot because we're not typically constrained by these. We're offering a, a specific service that's 
maybe for the general public rather than for mainstream education, or if it is for mainstream education, it's one narrow vertical of the learning. It's not trying to cover the whole curriculum. So that's actually a, a, a nice sweet spot to be, because that's typically where you find the more innovative, interesting ideas. It's not, it's not inside, inside the mainstream of provision. Publishers would love to be doing it, but really struggle. And ministries of education would love to, but are, are just really, really struggling. So, so um, uh, one, I won't bring too many theories into this, but one theory I really like is Puntadera, and he, he talks about how technology gets merged with learning, and he sort of sees it as, a, as an evolution. So, so, so um, if you think about, I don't know, but perhaps a, a, a test in a classroom or something, well, yeah, the test in a classroom, that the sort of early stages, you're taking the technology and you're just doing a swap for what was happening already. You know, so maybe maybe homework, and I'm, 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 writing, I'm writing homework on a bit of paper, and I'm writing homework in an email and submitting it. Same, same activity, technology is just, is just replacing it. And then you get a kind of augmentation where, where it can do a few more things. So I'm doing my homework on an email, but it's actually a Google form, and I can pick a bunch of things so that you can automatically calculate whether I got things right or not. The teacher automatically calculates it. They don't need to manually mark it or something. So that's an augmentation where it's it's sort of enhancing what was happening already, but it's not it's not dramatically different. It's just getting a bit better. And then the modification is where you start actually fundamentally changing what's happening. So so perhaps the students recording their voice and uh, the, uh, the, stu the teacher is using those voices to mix something up, which they turn into the activity for the next day, or something where you're actually doing an, a, 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 a transformed activity. And the redefinition is where you're doing it entirely differently. So students are creating online, online podcasts and videos and engaging external, external stakeholders in what's going on and interviewing people in the streets. And so suddenly you've, you've fundamentally changed um, the kind of learning and teaching you were doing in a way that you couldn't have considered doing before bringing tech in, and and this is the this is the sort of the different stages, and it's not always the case that everything needs to move up those stages, but it's certainly the case that if you're down in the S and the A area, you're not doing anything fundamentally different, and you need to embrace the tech and understand what it can do to help you move further up into the modification and redefinition stages. So I find that very helpful when we think about things. And I guess fun examples of at the edges. So we talk about virtual reality. There's a super cool virtual reality app, which is helping future postmen not get bitten by dogs. Sounds funny, but it's really, it's really good. Um, and literally, that it, it is that. You, you role play a postman, you're walking up the, it's video, you're walking up to people's houses, the different scenarios happen, you decide how, how, you, how you interact with the people or with the dogs and what happens, and in some cases you get bitten, in some cases you don't. This is a serious uh, health and safety issue for the UK Postal Service anyway. Um, I, I, another another great example is Liu Lishu. So they're a, a language learning business in China. Um, they they're very focused on the the sort of IELTS exam leveling type of um, type of uh, training, and they have an exam simulator. It's an app, and you you simulate taking the IELTS exam. So you you are interviewed. There's a person who talks to you. You speak back. It transcribes everything that you say, puts back the words that you said, and it highlights in your in what you said areas where you made mistakes or where you made common mistakes and advice about what you should have said instead. Well, that's pretty awesome. I mean, it, it's fairly dry training for an exam, but for people who are taking these exams, they pay hundreds of dollars to take the exam and it's giving you a, a, a live, meaningful feedback a, a, as often as you want to in a way that, that you would only get with very, very one-to-one -one teaching, but, but obviously much cheaper this time. So that's a kind of cool edge, a cool tech edge case. And I guess we're, we're, we, um, we, we're quite lucky to play around in some of these edge cases as well. This is a, a screen grab from an event we ran, oh, must be, yeah, about a year ago, in fact, where we were um, in Berlin, where we just invited a bunch of artists who were using, using artificial reality and AI, or using AI mostly, to generate music and generate art. So they, they, were, they were sort of on the, on the raw hybrid of, of creation with um, with computers, and so we had a series of these crazy artists showing us um, uh, very robots that made art, um, automatically created albums. So so you create a genre, and and this this bot would would generate an album, including album covers, including soundtrack, music, multiple things, and and upload them. And some of them were even being sold these albums. So it was just really fun edge cases. I guess these are just examples of 
tech at the edge where there's really innovative things happening that um, that, that that could pull its way back into mainstream learning. And and that that artist create thing is I think another fairly key thing, key, key piece. So this is a. Um, this is a picture just from one of my colleagues where they are um, they're sort of trying to think through some work throughs on different on, on, on the app and obviously working in the app creating business there's a level of digital and creativity all the time we're, we're, we're building stuff but um, maybe this is a nicer slide to have a look at so um, uh, Jane Hart is this woman who does an annual survey of all the tools used across the globe for digital learning. Um, often it's slightly skewed towards the kind of corporate learning space, but she does a, a t she, she polls experts in digital learning around the world and asks them what tools they're using. And I really like this. So this is the list of the top 100 tools being used for learning, uh, ed learning in, any, in any, um, any type of learning, not just language. And if, if you look at these tools, Almost all of them are tools that help you make and do things. It's tools that, that students are creating slides or, or are, students are creating a YouTube channel that other people are watching or Zoom, it's for meetings, it's Skype. Um, so it, it, it's not just consumptive type of tech, it's creative type of tech or it, um, and, um, it's notepads. And, and I thought this was a really nice reality check because actually some of the best uses of tech are helping people make and do and create. It's not being a, a, a passive consumer. Um, Alan November runs a, a, a big event, a big ed tech event in, in the US every year. And, and he, yeah, his, his, his sort of more for main, mainstream education. And, and his point was that it's pointless testing people on stuff that you can Google. You should be testing them on things where they have to create and make and do, which is a nice, a nice sort of reality check. And I guess this also applies where we talk about the emerging tech. So often when I'm, when I'm doing talks like this and you open open for questions people ask what about vr what about ai what about sort of voice interfaces and and for lots of these things the ones that get me the most excited are when students can create things as part of their learning students are creating their own voice um voice game on on, on alexa it's not that we've created a tool that helps you learn you useful even more useful is if students are actually building something themselves and using it and, and luckily, it's fairly inexpensive to create 360 video, to create quite a lot of these, these tools. So, so I'm, I'm most excited about tech that, that you can use to make things. So this was the sort of tech for creation. And this third, this third area, the learner centricity, goes closer into um, what, what we do at Babbel and some insights that we get from Babbel. And so the, the, the thing that's exciting and scary with digital B2C, digital content learning that goes out to just the consumer, somebody out there, somebody around the world, the learner, is that they only come there if they want to be there. That's the whole thing, right? I, I've got enough other distractions in my life. I've got um, YouTube, my child's in the background, um, what's happening on Instagram, the, the news, crazy stuff going on in the US. You, 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 your world's surrounded by distractions. And so it, it really puts a responsibility on, on you, the tech creator, in our case, the app creator, to try and help students be excited enough to want to be using, spending their time on your app and not somebody else's. Um, and. Uh, how do we know that? How do we know it's the right thing? Well, on, on our side, we're, it's really tricky, right? Because we, it, we could get, a, we could get a, a group of people to come in and talk to us, but we have millions of users and they're scattered all over the world. So you don't really know that this small group is truly representative. So these are just some of the examples of the kinds of things we do. So we do quite a lot of A-B testing. So you, you might come in and without realizing it, be directed to the screen on the left or be directed to the screen on the right. And we will try to understand, did you interact differently? It's, it's sort of the same. They're both a welcome screen. They're suggesting slightly different things you might do. And, and we just watch that. So we have enough people coming in that we can segment. We can say, all right, let's look for people at this level of language learning. We think they're probably in this age demographic. Let's try out these two, these two types. And we just watch to see what happens. So we, we, we learning by watching what, what other people are doing, sort of. Um, Another, um, another, another way we do it is we have a, a couple of ways of directly asking. So on the, on, the, on the screen on the left, you can see a little pop-up message that appears and goes, hey, you know, do you want to, would you mind giving us a bit of information, a few thoughts about what you think about your learning experience? So we, we kind of directly ask. 
Um, we have a, a wish board where, where we ask students to come in and suggest improvements and suggest new features, which are great. They're fantastic. It's super useful for us. Because if you're, if you're willing enough to take the effort to go and suggest something, that you, you're already a learner who engages with our content, and it helps us understand how, how to improve it. Um, the other thing we do, which I particularly like, is sometimes when you, when you um, agree, when you're in the app and a message pops up to talk to us and you agree, there's actually physically a person on the other side. So we have, we have um, UX researchers. And what you're seeing here is, a, um, is how we get, get the experience. So, so your app will pop up your camera, and you will keep using the app, and you'll be a researcher who's, who's also in, in, in camera. So you'll be talking to a researcher using the app, and we're asking questions. And then I, I get, um, we get small videos, which is a summary of the conversation between, the, between the, the learner and our researcher and how they're using the app and how they talk to us. And these are super cool because we can pick anybody in any geography at any time of day and just try and have a conversation. Um, so it's a great way of getting feedback when, when actually very, very few of our learners are based in Berlin. Another thing which is fun, so we, we only fairly recently started launching podcasts. We, we started um, late last year. And we were struggling to, there's a lot of great learning podcasts out there already. And we cover lots of different languages. And so we were struggling to, to figure out what would be the right kind of podcast. You know, is it about immersion? Is it about a sort of exciting story? Is it, is it literally sort of training grammar review? And so we, we, we just released lots of different podcasts using different type ty different types of, of of interaction and learning into different geographies and then watch what happens and you get to see you know um, adoption how the growth works whether people subscribe whether they just listen passively and don't subscribe to get the next one and that's been super super interesting just as a as a as a try of a perspective so all of these podcasts still exist and they're all going very well um so feel free anybody to to try them out um but like here's a great example so so in this this particular screen we were trying to understand, this was our, our first, the first series we rolled out, um, and we were trying to understand what worked and what didn't. And so this is a, an analysis of one particular episode, which thousands and thousands of people had played, and we get to see where they drop off. So literally, this is a summary of, of, of where people dropped off in the flow, and then what, was ha what we were doing at that point in time. So we were trying to understand, okay, this kind of thing they stick with, oh, here they actually repeated and went backwards and forwards a bit. Oh, and, and that helped us shape how we do future ones. So again, it's an example of, of using live data to help us understand what, what students are thinking without actually going to ask the students themselves. Um, and I guess if, if, there was, if, if you're interested in this stuff, um, if the sort of how you engage digitally is an, is an area that, that, that fascinates you, you, you might possibly have heard my colleague Jenny's talk. She was doing a talk right, right up front today, talking about behavioral economics and, and, and how, people, how people motivate. These would probably be my five um, go-to books that I encourage people to have a look at if they're trying to understand that and trying to understand how to, how to weave it into what they're building. None of them are about language learning. They're all about how, how, how people change their habits and, and how, how you can build your own healthy habits. Um, several, of the, several of the presenters that I heard today were talking about the need for you as a person to, to build your own learning habits if you want to become a good language learner. You need, to, you need to put some structure in it or you need to set yourself some goals. And in a way, these are, this is clues as to how that can work, but they clues structured in a way that you as a, as a teacher or you as a tech creator can, take, can make it easier for the learner. You can put some scaffolding in for them. And they, they're covering slightly different areas. Make It Stick is very strongly about learning specifically. Hooked, nudge, habits, they're all about um, it, it, any kind of behavior changes. Um, flow is about the importance of, of, of building up some momentum in your learning and not just being in tiny fragmented pieces. But I would strongly recommend all of these. Please grab the, do a screen grab and, and ha have a look at any of them that you haven't seen before. Okay, so I did want to make some of this talk about the technologies and the emerging technologies and how to make sense of that. And I just want to sort of dial back for that in a second. So, so and to see what, what we babble think about it, and then I'll be opening up for, for discussion in the chat. Um, so so what, what, what does this mean to all the emerging tech? And, and I guess going back to our original 
our original um, tension between between the the teacher and the robots or the the, the human the human and the machine and trying to understand the, the the blend and I guess I guess our take is that the perfect teacher is both of those and it's somehow uh, a merging hybrid of the two and as time passes and as need changes that that blend shifts in one direction in another direction but by being aware of that blend and trying to maximize the tech part it helps you reach way way more learners than you would otherwise if you're just cautious about making sure that the teacher face-to-face -face type of learning is working well you'll miss out whereas if you could if you're looking at how tech could be leveraged to support it or expand it or reach more actually it's it's quite a nice it's a nice sort of a blend to be tracking um, so one of the things we do, which I, I, I always think is super cute, is we we try to use we get tons of data, right? We have we have, as I mentioned, thousands, thousands, thousands of students who go through our, our courses and they they type in text responses to things and they answer questions and they, they engage with the content. Um, and as time passes, we we can we look at the the responses they put in, and we see that quite a lot of them are making fairly to, to classic computers, yes or no. Yes, you got it right. No, you got it wrong. But humans are, are a bit softer than that because you could get it almost right. And maybe for that context, it doesn't really matter that you get it wrong because I know that your level's really no, low. I know you've got this almost right. Actually, that's cool. Just keep the conversation flowing. Don't stop you and correct you. And humans do that fairly naturally. And, and computers don't do that very naturally. But what we were able to figure out is by looking at by looking at multiple answers and feeding the previous previously wrong answers into into our um, algorithms that we put together, that quite a lot of those wrong answers actually in the context were good enough. You know, good enough is good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. And so we were able to change how some of our interactivity worked to recognize those good enough situations and just say, yeah, it's close enough. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We, I, know, I, I got what you meant. Um, and we haven't rolled this out to all languages yet. Um, it's quite technically challenging, but I, I really like the 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 idea that the tech is kind of helping make the responsiveness a bit more human-like. It's not just being like a sort of old school old school robot. Um, another one, and this is one that we spend a lot of time in right now, is you again. You heard several several different people um, spe speaking about. The, the wide range of different tools that they like to use when they're learning and how that changes in, in the lower levels. You're sort of just struggling away at some basics and then you get to the higher levels, you're in, you're in B1 and you start wanting just immersion and, and listening to news channels and watching movies, but ideally ones at a low enough, um, at a sort of simple enough language level and just the sort of the, 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 the appetite for a much broader range of things. And we realized at Babbel that we, we really weren't being very good at that. We were being super excellent at, content that we've carefully structured and packaged and we track how that works and we help you progress through it fast and we kind of high speed you to to more conversational skills but but we weren't super great when it came to recommending outside that and so we've spending a lot of time this year both building some new outside experiences i mentioned the podcasts uh, we run some great expert sessions on facebook called ask me anything where where we have Every week we have different language experts available and anybody can ask them any questions about language learning and they answer it. In fact, I think I think uh, this looks like Tara in the screen grab who I have here and she was certainly in the earlier channel. I saw her chatting in the channel, so she might even be there, be there now. Um, um, uh, we, 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 we've started helping people go to physical language schools. We have something called Babel Travel where you can book, book to go to other countries and immerse yourself in the language for a while, but, but also just Netflix. And so we're trying to understand what's the smartest way of recommending other experiences beyond the, the, the more classic learning experience and try to sort of broaden our, broaden our remit here. We certainly don't have it right at the moment. We're running lots and lots of trials of different platforms and different tools and different kinds of experiences. Um, yeah, very open for feedback and questions and suggestions on, on, on how to master this. But so we, we're, we're very focused on how this is a smart way of thinking about all the different tech, right? So virtual reality, HoloLens, Cool, what can we do with it? Virtual experiences, virtual travel, immersive experiences, great. Who's out there doing that kind of thing? Can we guide our learners to it? You know, it, it's, that, it's that kind of idea, how to, how to be more embracing of, of sort of emerging tech and, and, and pointing, highlighting good use cases for, for language learning. 
And so I guess I guess that's more or less what I wanted to cover. So I'm I'm trying to be the the tech advocate here and look at look at how technology helpfully fits into a learning into a learning world. Um, that's my role at Babel and 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 my enthusiasm beyond Babel as well. Um, to talk about the different types of thinking about technology engaging with learning and the sort of substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition as, it, as, it, as, as you really start depending on the text power to do things as opposed to the original sort of pre-tech concept. Um, the, 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 the good call out for helping learners be creators and makers and not just being consumers, not being passive absorbers of stuff, but actually actively doing things in the, in the, in the, in the, the tech and learning. Uh, we spoke a bit about learners themselves and learner engagement and hooking them in and some of the some of the the, the tools and the techniques around that and then i guess more broadly about our, our, our take that that it's not only tech and it's not only humans it really is about a blend of those two things and trying to help people find their unique path through those and i guess that was that was really what i wanted to share um i'm going to um I'm very open to questions now. I just need to figure out how I can get back into the actual live chat because I'm in a backstage version of that at the moment. Um, but um, please do post questions. Oh, here's Scott. He can maybe guide me through that. Thanks, Scott. No problem. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. Um, we do, uh, If actually, on the there's a backstage link and an event thing that you can go back and forth between the two chat contexts on the side. Ah, but, got it. Um, but uh, I, I was curious from a technology standpoint, what do you find like on a sp for specific technologies, like what do you find the most interesting new technology, like things that people really haven't had in the past for learning a new language that, that you find very exciting or that Babel finds very exciting in really helping people with their motivation or helping people um, uh, move forward in, the, in their language journey? Um. Great question. I guess probably I would answer it slightly differently if I'm thinking of an individual learner or I'm thinking of somebody like ourselves who's the provider of, 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 of learning. So I'll, I'll try and answer it from both sides. Um, from, from the perspective of an individual language learner, it's almost certainly around immersion. There's awesome tools that just help you ex feel like you're experiencing walking down the street in Portugal and hearing Portuguese and being a bit more immersed in it, whether it's 360 video, whether it's um, the full on kind of HoloLens virtual reality type of thing, whether it's just fairly simple tech like podcasts, but just really well crafted podcasts. So, so the ability, whether it's Google Earth, so you can go and literally walk with camera, walk around streets and just get a sense of, sense of what those look like. So I would, I'm, on the tech side, I mean, for, 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 learn, for language learning, I'm probably super into just what how we can help that immersive type experience happen how you can be surrounded by the language in a more authentic way without actually being the what that looks like and i guess also very cool is there's a lot of tech around uh, natural language processing speech processing which could help you practice speaking and give you feedback on you speak your speaking it's it's fairly emerging and it's not particularly easy to deal with unless you're a company who's packaging something up. Um, but the technology, the whole auto translation plus this plus the speaking part has accelerated dramatically in, in the last four or five years. And so there's some super powerful things there. Hmm. And then I guess from a company's company's perspective, it's probably around the machine learning space, the big data, the, the fact that if, if we have enough learners going through a, a network of paths, we can learn from that which paths were more effective for who and, and which guidance was more useful to who. And then we can sort of auto, or start automating or dialing what we suggest to who to try and help them have a, a richer learning outcome at the end. So I guess that's a that was three texts, but does that help? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was trying to read the, the next questions, but I don't really understand uh, either of them. <laughs> One asked if you're using word embeddings in Babel. I don't know if you know what that means. No, I, I do I not. See, I see that. I don't know what that is. Etienne, do tell us a bit more. Um, how can we share the cool stuff we make with tech at the edge of Babel? Um, good question. We have a we have a blog, but we're not always consistent about communicating what we're working on on our blog for no no real reason except for the fact that we tend to get a bit busy. Um, 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 it's a super good question. I guess if you follow me on Twitter, I will I will I will try and take this as a call out to make more of a point of of flagging it up. 
Um, if any of my other Babel colleagues are here in the um, are here in the chat, they're very welcome to to make a better suggestion. And and um, at the end of, of the talk, you were talking about uh, taking students and kind of pushing them out to content that, that's outside of, of Babel or outside of your app. Um, do you try to, to sort of reintegrate that into the learning experience that you're providing as well? Like assume that that you know they had some some um, interactions outside that you can use to to help their learning journey going forward, or or are you just trying to so kind of keep them out? No, it's a cool, awesome question. So if you'd asked me this question six months ago, a year ago, I would have I would have looked at you a bit blankly and spoken aspirationally about wanting to do that. Um, I, I'm now probably stronger on the aspiration side. So we're, we're super into doing that because really as soon as you start getting up, you know, sort of A, A2, B1 kind of area, the best thing you can do is get really speaking and go and do real kind of missions in real life. Um, and so we're, we're spending quite a lot of time right now understanding what that might look like and how we would scaffold that and what what to do when they come back. Do we ask them how it went? Do we do we just sort of use that insight to try and guide them what next? We don't have an answer yet, but it's something we're spending a lot of time quite excitedly working on working on right now. Yeah. So um, I, I'm so actually curious from a, a really specific standpoint. You're, you're producing your own podcast, right? You have this pod and you obviously have some data about how far people are listening into it. Is that anonymized or can you see that, you know, I'm if I'm learning German and I'm using Babel as an app and I listen to a German podcast, can you see he's had exposure to so, uh, so mostly it's anonymized because we use whatever platform you've got. So if you if yep. you if you're listening on Spotify, we don't actually get the connection that you're a Babel learner and you're in Spotify and you're the same Babel learner. So so right. some occasionally we do. There's various sometimes we play it in app. But but mostly that particular experience is anonymized. So um, that becomes a, a for the for the podcast experience in itself. That's not the end of the world because because we can we can tell that you clicked a link in the app. So we got some sort of touch points. Where it gets that more tricky is is the the, the richer offline experiences. So if we're sending you to a language school, we'd love to send we'd love to know who you are when you go and give you a pack of what these are the skills this learner has. This is the gaps. And um, so we, we, we're busy working on a sort of overarching framework of, of a sort of slightly more finer grained breakdown of, of, the, um, of, of the, the standards or the can-do statements so we know what level somebody's at. So we, we're trying to get on top of that at the moment. It wasn't previously a problem for us because we kept them all inside the app, but it's a yep. challenge right now. I, I can answer a couple of these other questions that are flying sure. in. So Etienne, the answer is actually we are kind of doing that. That's how we figure out the in, in the example I mentioned how we figure out the right and wrong and almost. We we use we we use exactly that. But we start from we start um we start from what the the text that the, the learners put in and then we map to figure out what those words mean. Um, I saw a comment from Jo Weber, uh, who I know, ex colleague from Cambridge. Hey Jo, um, uh, she's super into multi sort of online multiplayer games. And no, we haven't yet thought of that, but if you're making one, we, and it's exciting enough, we're super happy to point learners to go there because we we, we kind of like partnering with people and sending learners to interesting challenges. Um. Okay, great. Um, so if, uh, if people have questions after the fact, they can also put them in chat and we can forward them on to Jeff later. Um, but what we'll do now is we'll uh, say thank you and we'll turn off for a minute or two and then we'll come back with the last um, the last talk that we have. So I'd like to thank Jeff for joining us, taking time out of his day. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed the talk. So thank you so much for, for being with us, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for hosting a great event. It's cool to be part of it. All right. Cheers. <laughs>